Hey everybody, it's Bob Ost and uh, it's Friday. It's the true community gathering. Theater Resources Unlimited welcomes you all. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, and there might be some people out there who don't, uh, we're an organization, a service organization for theater. Um, we uh, offer services um, in particular developing and nurturing um, theater artists and producers. Uh, we teach people in particular again, the word in particular, um, the business of theater and how to how to navigate and understand the business and think like a business person. Um, we still have a, a, an amazing community of artists and creative people, so don't be afraid of us. Uh, if you'd like to actually be part of the community gatherings every week, uh, it's not hard. You can simply shoot me an email um, at trunltd at aol.com, trunltd at aol.com, and heck, I'll just email you every week and invite you to come to our community gatherings and our, our Zoom, and you can ask questions and be in the room. Um, so wh why do we do this? Uh, I always start off by saying this, I, because you never know when somebody's going to actually discover us who doesn't know us. Uh, April 17th, 2020. Um, 2020 ring a bell for anyone? There was something special that happened then. It was called shutdown. Uh, I have a theater company. Uh, service company, but it's, you know, for theater. And we had programs that were all live and all, had all sorts of things scheduled and I had major, big, big events scheduled for May. And then all of a sudden on March 15th, we we're all told to just close our doors and go home and stay there. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to run a business virtually. I didn't know what virtual was very much, but somebody introduced me to Zoom. Hello, Zoom. And um, Lo and behold, I learned how to actually um, navigate uh, Zoom. And I, I actually learned about a Zoom room, which is where you are now. We are in a Zoom room, essentially. Uh, and we're virtually recording it so that not only do, do I have people in my room that are from all over the world and all over the country, but uh, we also can go out there at, in YouTube and in and, and, uh, and a podcast and hopefully be seen and found and seen by a lot of people out there who don't know who we are, um, and hopefully find uh, interesting things that we have to say and learn some interesting things about theater. So um, here we are uh, three years later. Uh, this is the 157th, or I think it's the 157th consecutive uh, um, Zoom that we've done. Um, we've uh, We've been talking about all sorts of things. Early on, it was really about how depressed we all were and how helpless we all felt. And then we started talking about moving into other forms of, of storytelling and um, started finding out how to do Zoom readings and how to film things for Zoom. And um, we, we've we created a, a benefit, a virtual benefit every year where we actually take plays and we film them and edit them and then present them as mini films, small little films that are kind of amazing. Um, so many gifts came out of what seemed like a real disaster for all of us, but so many gifts came out of COVID and, and shut down. Um, also, one of the things that came out of it was we were forced to sit and think about the world. And uh, I think we learned a lot. And we've I think we've all found that there are things that we would like to see different in our world. Um, but storytelling uh, has, been, has been one of the cre a key uh, topics that we've looked at. Uh, we've talked about radio plays, we've talked about uh, podcasts, we've talked about all sorts of uh, ways of using medium, the different media, media to uh, tell stories and to create works of art. And today we're going to talk about something that I am completely not, not able to talk about. So I have a guest coming on with me who hopefully knows the questions I should be asking, because I may not be asking them. So I think Tim Kashani you're about to meet Tim Kashani. Here he is. Tim Kashani, you're going to have to really guide me on this because I'm not an AI expert. Uh, I don't I don't know what a lot of this stuff is. Um, so uh, I will try to ask questions that I think other people would ask. And some of them may not be the smartest, most incisive questions, and you'll forgive me. But in general, Tim, why don't you say hello to everybody and tell us a little bit about your background. I've known you for a long time. Tim used to be one of the producers that came to our speed date and would meet writers. He'd, he'd get pitched in a, in a room with, with 11 writers at a time 
all pitching crazily at each other at, at, diff, at 11 different producers. Uh, remember that, Tim? Do you, <laughs> what, I was do, it too? very, very fondly, in <laughs> fact. Oh, good, because it could have been traumatic. <laughs> so uh, welcome back to True. Um, and uh, obviously, you've been through a lot of changes since I knew you back then. Um, I don't think, I may be wrong, but I don't think AI and other of, of the VR and different uh, technologies were things that you were really engaged with back then. Um, how did you find, how did you come to them? And um, you take it, you do it. I'm, ta I'm talking sure. too much. <laughs> well, first of all, 157 is my lucky number. So this is perfect. Who knew? <laughs> would also like to say that there are no stupid questions. We are all learning this. We are students of life, students of art, students of everything. I may have been doing technology a little bit longer than some people, but anybody that claims to be an expert in this space, run from, because the space is changing incredibly fast. I had been using, even back then, I'll call them extended realities because that's part of what I studied in college back in the late eighties, you know, weird happenstance. There were three things I focused on in the tech side of my life, which was data slash artificial intelligence, which was very different back then. New realities where we were looking at computer graphics. This was before you had Pixar and then base operating systems all while performing musicals in the fine arts department. I've lived this dual life between arts and tech since, really since I've known. I was, as a kid in high school, I was making films. I, I loved seeing Spielberg's film of young him with the cameras and the editing. That was me only with a lot cheaper camera and editing system than he had in The Fablemans. And as you can see, I've played guitar in a rock band. I I just I love the convergence. Well, let's let's uh, let's start a little bit with um, like I knew you as apples and oranges. Uh, so, so tell everybody what apples and oranges is. Sure, apples and oranges. The name came about because we are based in Orange County, California, and New York City. Hence the apple and the orange. But it was also a great moniker for the way that we approach everything, which is a mixture between technology and art. <clears throat> and that goes back to our founding in 2008. Before that, I have still have a technology company called IT Mentors, where we built large systems for banks in New York, like the Morgan Stanleys and UBSs of the world, but also Microsoft was a client. And out of that, my wife and I launched co-founded Apples and Oranges. Apples and Oranges Studios is our for-profit. That's what produces on Broadway and feature films. And then Apples and Oranges Arts is a nonprofit that our foundation launched with a mission of taking the starving out of artists. And we have been working on that since 2008, looking at many different pathways and roadways. And what you do here is one critical component of that because as we all know, universities do a fantastic job of usually teaching skill, usually teaching different, different abilities for you to be, whether it's a writer, singer, dancer, but not a lot on the business side, most of them. And so people graduate and move to New York and are going to be the next big whatever or move to LA and the, get a rude awakening. And without programs like yours and some of the stuff that we do, it makes it very difficult for artists to find that financial path. Well, thank you for that. Um, let's uh, let's t t get some of the, the your theater background uh, out out there then, and then we can focus on the uh, the new technologies. Um, I, I just want people to know because you know you've you've produced. I, I I keep thinking of you in hair with hair, but I mean I, I know I know not the not your not the ones on your head, the one on stage, and I. I um I can't think of all of your credits because uh, I was focusing oh, so fine. much on you. <laughs> I mean, you, it, you've done some great stuff. Real, it's been a real joy. I, I I started like all of us did doing regional theater here in California. I started as a performer, then moved into directing and producing because I wanted to do certain shows, and I realized there's a financial aspect to it. And then uh, once I 
well, I wanted to go to film school for undergrad, but couldn't afford it. So I went back later in life and out of that launched a film company as well as helped build the Chapman Film School. And it was through all of that that we got introduced in, in a re weird happenstance way. We had hired somebody in New York to promote a film. And this was in 2008, right after the whole housing crisis, the Madoff scandal and hair had been sitting in, it had done the Shakespeare in the Park in the summer and was looking to move to Broadway. And I was approached by somebody to say, would you come on and be part of the producing team? And I said, no, I'm now I'm a, I'm a director. I, I'm out of the money side. Like I've done that part. And then I went and heard again and saw it, fell back in love with the show and, and was able to, even at that point, look at creative ways to take both the operational as well as the capitalization budget and use some newfangled things in tech back then. In fact, we put a camera in the theater, worked with the unions to do so, and we would film the final dance scene up on stage, which is legal because the show is technically over when the audience would come up. And every night we'd stream that on YouTube as a way to let people know that they had their Broadway debut for all of those in the audience. But it was also a fantastic way for us to sell tickets. And so Very then I smart. Moved. Very cool. Yeah. And while I was doing that, one of my friends on hair approached me and said, hey, there's these two amazing people you need to meet, Randy Adams and Sue Frost. And then I also met Kenny and Marlene Alhadoff, and they truly are just best people you can ever meet. If you ever get a chance to work with any one of those four, you're, you're absolutely lucky. And they had this little show called Memphis that was going to be coming into Broadway. And they asked if I would be willing to come on and work on it. And of course I said, no, because I always say no until about two or three meetings later. But then I had a lunch meeting that was supposed that I walked in like this. I don't have time. I can't do it. And I just, I, I fell in love with the people. And I read the script. It had David Bryan who wrote the music. And I was since my rock and roll days, he was the composer or the keyboardist for Bon Jovi. So they'd had that going for it. But it really was the message of the show. And, and what we agreed to is if I came on, then my role on the show would be to look at the marketing, the ticket sales using different techniques because it was a show that had original music no stars in it. In fact, they're all stars now. I mean, you look at Montego Glover, you look at James Monroe Iglehart, like they are icons, but this was their debut. And we we did. And, and I said, okay, I'll do it and came on. And we at that time used much more of a social campaign, which remember, this is 2009. This is before a lot of people were doing that. But we just generated copious amounts of shareable video. We gave the cast flip cams because we didn't have the iPhones that would allow us to do things in certain ways. And uh, we ended up creating this groundswell. We knew that the audience liked it, but we needed to make sure that the audiences knew about it so we could stay open. And then leverage that into an American in Paris, which I see Jane is on. And there's a lot of friends that I've worked with throughout the line and that one we did even more that one we took tons of different technical approaches to a show because we had to effectively change a perception most of broadway thought that it was a revival and it also was a gershwin musical at a time when people wanted to be young and hip and we had this amazing director and cast who we knew would resonate with audiences of all ages. We need to figure out ways to do that. So those are the three Broadway shows and then have done two feature films based on shows that one Emma the musical that we had optioned for Broadway, but felt that we just couldn't have it make financial sense at the time. So we filmed it instead. And then another one. So so did you work with Tom Pollock on that? Was that, oh, yeah. is, is that Paul, Paul Gordon's Emma? It is Paul's. Yeah. So I yeah. optioned with Tara Smith, now Tara Swibel, in 2013, 12, some, in, in the early 2000s, it had been at the Old Globe. Smash it there. Tara optioned it and then asked me to co-lead produce it with her. And we had Charlotte, the amazing Charlotte Wilcox, 
And we, we really ran numbers. And when I produce something on Broadway, I will only move it forward if I know that I've got a almost, I won't say nothing's a sure thing, but I, I really have to have a financial vision for it to make sure that this thing is going to recoup. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move the conversation now to, to tech because I know sure. that a, a lot of people in the room are, are, are dying to know more about uh, your uses of, of the new technologies. Um, can, you, can you sort of give us a rundown of which, what things you started bringing into your toolbox at, at, at what point and how you use them? And also, as a background for the whole thing, how open is the Broadway world, how open is the producing world to these technologies? Or is it, <laughs> is it a long, is it going to be a long haul to get people to kind of embrace it? It's mixed, like anything. I tend to, the, I'm one of those that just brings it in. And then people either go, well, what's going on? Or, or some people fight me on it. But everything I've brought in or introduced is now standard. When I think back to even so, be Memphis. specific. Be specific about that. Sure. I think that's that's a great part, a starting point for us. So, so what Zoom, have what have you what have you brought in? And, and Zoom what is, is now? yeah, Zoom is one of them. I happen to be involved in an investment fund that was the first investor into Zoom, so I brought it in in gosh, 2014 or 15. Um, by the started, way, I, by the way, I want your camera. You have you are like one of the best photographed guests I've had in three <laughs> years. You have a you have a terrific camera. I want to know more about that. Too. It's actually just the iMac Pro camera. I just light it well. Uh, Looks I, great. It's it's an HD camera, so it does that. But uh, but we because I I live in California and New York, and I was so tired of flying to New York for a two hour meeting when. I knew I could do a lot more virtually. So that was something we brought in. And then we also started using it very early on when we launched our theater accelerator. We always had done it virtually. This goes back to 2016. But the, the big thing that I would say, the two, two larger changes was analytics and data. Broadway tends to be, or tended to be, much has changed since when I joined it, very much a small group of people, amazing people, wonderful, brilliant people who had been doing things a certain way for a number of years because it worked. But when you look at the fact that 85 to 90% of all Broadway shows are going to lose some or all of their money, that's not a, it's working for me model. Like what can we do? So when you come to looking at marketing and advertising, and all of the things that are very expensive in a show, how can you correlate data across all of the different inputs that you have, whether it be your ticket sales, your social media, your website, any advertising you're running and move more towards a digital version of that. And then the other significant thing was utilizing traditional type video and other tools to engage audiences earlier in the process. One of the- so, so, it's, so it's not really at this point, it's not really about the creative. It's not about the pr production itself. It's about using technology to enhance the, the marketing, which is what you said was your, your original interest. Those were those in those current shows, basically because much of the creative had been accomplished. In American in Paris, we came in a lot earlier and that was, a real collaboration between the director, Christopher Wielden, and the entire design team. I didn't have any direct input into exactly what you were seeing on stage, but the environment that Christopher created allowed true collaboration where we were able to look at things like projections and other aspects that we're making it on stage. And how does that inform everything we do so that we create a unified experience? And one kind of side story is when I think back to one of my agreements with an American in Paris was if I, or sorry, with Memphis, is that if I came on, I would shoot the B-roll. Because back then, a lot of the B-roll was being shot in three camera view. And it was center lock off, two sides. And occasionally, they'd put one floating camera up front. Could you define B-roll for some, for the people? Uh, B-roll is the footage you shoot of your show 
that goes out in all the press outlets that shows who you are. And, and it kind of baffled me that people would rush to get the B-roll done when I felt that it was, if not the, one of the most important assets you had. You have your key art, which of course is important and you have other things, but those visual pieces. And again, this ties to the growth of everything from the Instagrams, the YouTubes. Now, TikTok is something we'll talk about definitely on this as a distribution point. And so I've looked at all of the social media platforms, not as a one-way force of, look how great I am, come buy a ticket, but much more about a collaboration between audience, show, creator, very much in the same way the film industry has things like Comic-Con and other things to get people excited. We wanted to get people excited. So we shot it with seven cameras. In fact, Christopher Ashley, who was the director of Memphis, was it was the B-roll setup day. And he said, oh, you know, I'm going to go get something to eat. I said, no, you got to stay. He's like, oh, this is, these are so boring. He said, put a reference monitor on his table. I said, just watch. And all of a sudden, I'm wiring cameras up from behind, from the side. It's, what are you doing? And then he saw through the lens and he saw lens flares as people were dancing and he's a filmmaker and he immediately got what we were doing. And so when we would do things like a reverse steady cam around into the lights, he's now on the God mic talking to the actors, the choreographers there. It, it just was this way to visualize the show that united the whole, whole team. So those were my, I'll call them low tech ways, but all, revol all revolved around some form of technology because technology doesn't just mean bleeding edge stuff that could break. It's truly how do you engage audience members who want to emotionally connect with what you're putting on stage. And so you're not selling them what they're getting in the, you're not selling them visually what they're getting in the theater. You're, you're selling and you're not even selling, you're inviting in for them to have an emotional experience. That's what theater is. And that's kind of what drives everything that we do. So um, let's see, what, is, what, we, what we would be the next step? Um, I know okay, that people so are, sal people are salivating. I'll, I'll go to the bleeding edge tech now so that you can. Uh, well, you also brought some, some ex examples you're going to show, which I think people are going to love to see. Yeah, what, what I thought I would do is just give you one quick reference point. That way we can start. And let's start with extended realities and then we can move into AI because that's kind of our trajectory into this space as well. This was, I'll just take two slides. We just presented yesterday. In fact, we flew back from the Augmented World Expo in San Jose it, or Santa Clara. It's a once a year event where People, it's the premier event when it comes to these extended realities like the ARs and VRs. And we ran a pitch contest there that we called the Metaverse Melodies. And we took three shows and they were pitching for the ability to have their show proof of concept using some of these extended realities. And effectively what we looked at and everything we do follows from this premise. We're in an industry that began many, many moons ago. And we all follow a very similar trajectory where we start with readings and we have thousands of them and we spend some amount of money. And then if things go well, we get into a lab or workshop and we spend more money. And then if things go well, now you're five years into it, you spend a lot more money. And these numbers actually should be even dropped lower since the pandemic all in hopes to get to Broadway, which only has about 20 available theaters every year because a bunch of them are taken. And even if you make it there and spend millions and millions of dollars, you have a really strong chance of losing all your money. And from a writer's perspective, like everybody that's on this call, one of the reasons we do this linear approach is you need branding. Before you can get licensing to get a tour or to get other pieces, your show needs to be seen. But when we rely on a lot of this physical infrastructure that we have right here, it takes a ton of time. So we wanted to rethink these first three, the readings, the workshops, and the out of towns is what can we do to reduce cost and accelerate the time? Broadway is going to be Broadway. 
And Broadway's, I was, we all thought that, well, we didn't know what was going to happen after the pandemic. And the model of it is actually still very similar to pre-pandemic. And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about Broadway because we're talking about new tech, but maybe in the Q&A, some of these questions will come up. So thus, if we're taking these three that sit in the middle, we said, how can we have some form of an impact on those technologies that will enable it in a way to accelerate? And so what we did is we started with a lot of people think that everything we're doing is new and it's not. So I'll, I'll throw this out for your audience right there. How many of you know this picture? I feel like I've seen it. Is yeah. it like icon it's iconic? It is. It's, it's, most people know this and, and they'll think that, I uh, see people are raising their hands, this is great. So this was from Maxell. And it was saying that our cassette tape is so amazing that it's going to feel like you're at a real rock concert. And then you had Memorex that said, is it live or is it Memorex? And both of those were promoting this idea of virtual capture of things that we normally see live. When you look at the idea of virtual, this was not to replace live concerts. And that's one thing that I want to make very clear is everything that we do is not to replace live theater. It's to enhance, extend, and accelerate. So we actually took that idea and said, well, let's look at the technologies that we have in front of us. So I'm going to focus on two, VR and AR, which stand for virtual reality and augmented reality. Theater is already doing augmented reality. When you, the minute we put a light or a sound, or a projection, or a backdrop, we are augmenting reality. The only time we're not is if you're standing on a street corner, unmiked and everything, and you're doing a sonnet. Okay, that's, that's reality standing there. It's just moving a lot faster now. When we look at what can be done with projection mapping, we can create entire worlds in effectively a black box that we couldn't create 10 years ago. Virtual reality is different in the sense that we are encapsulating what the viewer is going to see. And the easiest way to think about it is VR. If you've seen the movie Ready Player One, VR separates you from the actual world, where augmented reality just augments your curled world, like in the holodeck in Star Trek. So we said, how do we take these texts and allow them to be part of those first three parameters? So for example, a lot of you have used Zoom to do readings. That's fantastic. You can do it fast. You don't spend a lot of time trying to learn music. You're working on the book. And that's at the early stages. Many of the problems have to do with figuring out exactly what this story is and what the book is. Once you get past that, that workshop phase can get expensive very quickly. Therefore, we have been using a lot of these, there are a few hundred bucks. You can send them to actors. You can send them to producers. You can send them to investors. And we prototype worlds in them. And by prototyping the worlds, we're able to do it in an inc incredibly fast way so that you can actually get a sense for what's happening in that world. I have a, I have a question for you about Zoom. Zoom has a thing now that they do, didn't used to have it's a speaker gallery and immersive view what mm -hmm. do, do, is immersive view anything to do with what we're talking about today it is it, well so i again full disclosure i i invest in zoom i love zoom i know all the people there immersive view is one of the things that came out of the pandemic which was how can you create backdrops and let you have more of control over what you're doing in in the zoom world itself and it's, it's one of many tools that are used. One of the things we found with Zoom is there was just a lot of fatigue that happened during the pandemic. And so if you're going to do something on Zoom, either I say go one of two ways. Either go just completely low fidelity, meaning do a very simple reading. Don't try to make it fancy. Just hear the words. Work with actors. If you want to try to do something a little bit more creative, then look at some, and Zoom has avatars now, Zoom has app add-ins. So you can do 
some more things that way if you want to. But what we did is we used Zoom to develop, and this was a show we were working on that was supposed to be live in 2020 called Winter Lights. And it was to play here in California as at a new 500 seat theater at the Discovery Science Center in Santa Ana, a 40 minute musical spectacular, but of course we couldn't go live. So instead we built our characters as avatars in a place called Altspace, which is now shut down, unfortunately. Yet another company I invested in and was bought by Microsoft and Microsoft just closed them recently. But these are all live actors that we've created avatars for in a couple hours. I mean, this did not take a long time for us to spin up the avatars. And then the sets that we created took us days, weeks, because we would just use either free assets or cheap assets to prototype. It's like renting a set or costume. From there, once we worked out the story, we then used the Unreal game engine to now actually build something that was much more photorealistic, including the backgrounds that you will see for the winter lights. And so now we were able to pre-visualize the show. And then those assets that we now did in virtual reality made their way onto the set. So here's the show live that played this year at the Discovery Cube, and there's our actress. And in the background, you will see that is this, the, what looks like a set on there is all done from photorealistic game engine projections. And these are things I can iterate in hours, not months, so that we can aesthetically get the sense for the show. And the nice thing is there's lots of people out there that have built games that happen to also love theater and music, and they're willing to work at all different price range levels to get involved with seeing a show come to fruition. And it just kind of goes on and on. And there's yet another shot of, you can see the purpleness of the avatar made its way into the, that's my wife, Pamela, playing the character. So we kept a ton of the aesthetic that we had designed tonally. So that show, the minute we knew we were going live and for you directors out there, we were able to mount it insanely quick. Like I directed the show. So I stage manager gave me a week to stage the show. I said, I don't need a week. She said, no, every director says that you're gonna need a week. I, said, I don't need a week. So I, I get up there, I'd stage the whole show in a day. And she was completely baffled. She said, did you, how did you, do you, are you see the people that see it in your head? I said, absolutely not. I said, I've spent months in this show already in a 3D environment directing this already. So now I just put it up on the stage. We lit it. Then I restaged some few things. I mean, we, we literally shaved weeks off of what was going to be a four to six week period. We were able to shove way down. Same with the lighting, same with the sets, same with the costumes. So VR and AR still don't have a big enough audience for distribution right now to where you could make a living only doing virtual reality musicals. We're doing them. We've got three in the pipeline. And we're selling tickets to some of them. It will be at some day. So my mm -hmm. philosophy is, especially... Pay attention, everybody, on Monday, Apple is going to release their headset, 10 a.m. You might want to watch their keynote. So now you'll have Meta in the game. You've got HTC. You've got Apple. You've got Epic Games. You've got Unity. You've got major players. And what they need desperately is content because most of the content was built by engineers rather than artists like yourselves. I, I have to ask you this because... I'm not sure if if many people in the room are going to be able to take what you said and go off and do it. <laughs> so, so let's take it like a step at a time. Um, sure. Where do we where do we start in your in in your development process? What is the first app that we have to get? Um, what is what are the, the tools that we need? What I suggest, and and some of our theater accelerator alum are on here, so they can attest to. There's multiple entry points. To me, the simplest thing is to don't buy anything at first. Literally just use your computer. Go on and look at what these 3D social worlds look like. For example, VR chat is something you can look at, which is a social world that many people have built their theaters upon. 
And I've got a list of resources I can send you over the weekend to send out to the group too. So th that's all the more reason why everybody needs to put their email into the, into the <laughs> chat so we can send you this over the weekend. Well, actually, it won't be until Monday because I have a benefit on, on Sunday. One, one thing that may make everybody feel a little bit better on here is that my wife, Pamela, who you saw, who's a Broadway actress, she was the original Rapunzel in Into the Woods on Broadway. We met, she was the feather duster in Beauty and the Beast. She is not the techie in the family. She uses technology to help her do whatever she does, but she's not like me who will go buy every new piece of device in there and try it. But she was one of the first virtual reality actors. And what she found is that it was actually easier for her to do what she does in headset rather than Zoom. Once she got used to the controllers and wearing the headset, she could, she could be an actor. She could create this thing and make it come to life. And right now, I mean, you'll see this is this size. The next iteration for Meta is half the size, twice the resolution. This is a headset over here from HTC that just released. This thing weighs nothing. So this, the heavier ones are cheaper and is a great way to start. This is $1,000, which might sound like a ton of money. But I'll tell you, when you do a lab or workshop in New York City, you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if I can get a show developed at that price, at this, it uh, saves me a lot. So to get back to your question about how do you get involved in this? How do you do there, it? <laughs> yeah, the there are a lot of people in this field. So for example, a group created a while back, a thing called Fifth Wall Forum, which was, they're not, they're currently dormant right now, but they're theater makers who wanted to align theater makers, tech people, and story writers and created this thing. I, I was a mentor for it. <clears throat> you want to, and this is what I can put out. There's people like Stephanie Riggs and Alex Colom and Brendan Bradley. Like they live this stuff. I worked with Brendan. Been, yeah, they've been doing this for years. And so the easiest thing to do is literally just follow them on social and go to their events or come to some of our events that we're doing. Uh, Bre Brendan actually designed uh, a uh, an avatar uh, character for uh, our first benefit in, in 2021. Yeah. The nice thing about the community right now is it feels very much like the tech community that I grew up in before it became the thing that it is today, which is a massive, massive commercial entity. I mean, I used to build my own computers and everybody shared. And we're still that way when it comes to theater and new tech because it isn't a huge market yet. Once it becomes a huge market, everybody's going to patent everything and you're going to have this and that. Um, let me ask, I want to ask the room, the hands that are up, are those still responses to the uh, iconic uh, photo that you showed earlier or, or <laughs> do you have questions? Um, was it, uh, I, I heard Mac, Max Dell and I heard Bozy, Bozy speakers. What, uh, what was it? Oh, what uh, was the thing? Yeah, Max yeah. L and Memorex. Max L and Memorex were Max, the two. Oh, okay, it was Max L. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so Rob Hoffman has his hand up, so he may have a question. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, my, my question, Tim. Um, so I'm actually, uh, I work at the University of Minnesota Duluth. We have a VR uh, uh, lab. We have a uh, motion capture lab. And I'm in discussions with Lux Machina. Uh-huh. If you're familiar with them, yeah, okay, I am. all right, very good. And and they, uh, what did you call it? Digital mapping or mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So I'm in discussions with them because they're looking to to have a get a piece of it. Well, they need they want to get into education institutions. They're at NYU, Tisch, and a few other places. So I'm in discussions with them about some of these capabilities. So so I'd, I'd like to create a sandbox for them, and I'm just wondering if if this makes sense. Uh, you know, we've got a very strong musical theater program here in our in our campus is to create a sandbox that would maybe uh, some some kind of hybrid between what you're talking about, like an all virtual or augmented reality type of, of, of theater and and our traditional theater. I mean, we've got, again, a strong uh, traditional musical theater training program here that's very successful. So uh, what about a hybrid and what kind of talent would we need to hire? Uh, to, I mean, do we need a digital virtual reality? Production Rob, Rob simplify, simplify the question. <laughs> okay. Oh, I got it. I got it. He's talking about the talent you need. So, first of all, I'll say big yes 
on anything that you can build. And it's actually something that I'm trying to promote as many universities to do because this may be controversial, but I really feel like if universities are not preparing their students, especially art students, to look at alternative means for simply the traditional. So I love the traditional, don't get me wrong, they need that. But if that's all they're teaching and people are graduating with a big student loan debt, that's not, doesn't make me happy because we all know that it's incredibly competitive. So what you're talking about is creating cross collaboration on the campus where you can have, depending on whether it be your musical theater program, your film program, your engineering program, your game design. Like I'm doing something at UC Irvine where I'm a trustee, where we're collaborating with the games, fine arts, school of sustainability. We're building a VR game experience on climate change. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Now, the video walls that you're talking about are yet another tool. We work with a company called Disguise Software or Disguise. They make hardware and software which any of you in the traditional theater world probably know of Watch Out and Disguise. They do most of the projection work on Broadway. Disguise, for example, is the one that MJ is using right now. And what's nice about creating that kind of hybrid reality is the underlying assets that you're creating, whether it be for a video wall or for a projection or a VR headset, they're the same basic assets. So you want to build, I, I heard some great proposals of what people are building. Some of them are out there. You can do that rapidly in this technology, which allows you to then share it across multiple different ways. So I, I say thumbs up the whole way. You can pop me an email if you have some questions. I can share some of the things so you're not spending a fortune doing it because you shouldn't spend a lot of money until you start to know what you're doing. People will sell you a million dollars this or $2 million that. You don't need to spend that right now. We probably yeah. should talk about AI though, because before we run out of time, I yeah. think we should delve down that because that's the that's the uh, virtual elephant in the room. And that's that's the headsets you, you've got there. That's that, that's AI what we're talking about. with, with the headsets. Uh, This is VR and, and XR oh. right now. But as we get into AI, let's just first debunk the term. <clears throat> so AI has been around forever. It simply, as we all know, means artificial intelligence. So that's not, we don't need to fight AI because we've been, every one of you has used some form of artificial intelligence in everything that you've done already. If you use a spell checker, that's artificial intelligence. What we're really talking about is generative AI right now, which really is tied to machine learning. So the difference in traditional AI, there's a lot of stuff I grew up with, is we as humans were involved in creating the rules and boundaries of how the technology would work with us. So again, in theater, the minute we had technology running light boards, that's really artificial in the sense that a person's not turning it on and off. But we set the, the rules. When you get into machine learning, where we sit right now is you have what are called these large language models. That's ChatGPT or BARD from Google. And effectively what they've done is created a piece of software, huge amounts of hard drive space, <laughs> tons and tons of processing power, and said, hey, computer software, I'm not going to train you. I'm going to feed you information. I am going to send you out to read every musical, every play, every book ever written since the dawn of humanity that we have understandable and figure out what are the patterns in that. So generative AI is all about pattern matching. It's not sentient. So that's why ChatGPT, if you haven't done it yet, I suggest you do it. Patricia can tell you that we wrote a musical in 90 minutes during our theater accelerator class on ChatGPT. We threw it some ideas. It wrote the premise. It knew about Jack Fortell's book, The Secret Life of the American Musical. So it was able to structure it via Jack. Uh, it knew who Stephen Sondheim was. It wrote the outline, wrote the first scene, wrote the first song. Now, was it going to be replacing what everything that happens on Broadway right now? Absolutely not. But I'll tell you, every week it gets 
smarter and better. And I just did another test on it since our class. And it's already now getting to the point where it's like, wow, this is as good as at least 50 to 60% of stuff that people are submitting to us as humans. Now, we only take about 10%. So it's still not as good as the stuff that we actually look at. But what this means is you as writers out there, you really have to become the masters of your genre and craft because you are competing against this in certain ways. And, and I'm not going to make a value judgment on this with whether this is right or wrong. I'm just more of a, this is coming. Uh, I still 100% support human beings. But Yay. I, <laughs> well, I just feel like I would be remiss to say, don't worry about this. It's not that good because I'd be lying to you. I was on in New York and there was a panel speaking about AI to all the road people. And somebody said, don't worry about AI taking jobs, think of it more as it's going to just save you time in your current jobs. I knew this person, so I didn't call them out for it, but I pulled them out afterwards. I said, that's a lie. It's going to replace jobs. I'm, I'm sorry, it is. Every new technology has replaced jobs. And the way that you adapt with that is you have to become part of that system. So for example, in film, it's already been doing it with visual effects for years. The way we used to do visual effects versus the way we do visual effects today is very, very different. People have moved into CGI and other forms of technology-driven pieces. So AI is writing scripts, it's writing music, and it's also creating generative imagery. So when you talk about something like Dolly or Mid Journey, or there's a million free ones out there right now. You literally type in a text prompt that says, build a theater for me that has that looks like a cross between Wicked, Phantom of the Opera, and American in Paris. And it knows what those things are, and it'll create something for you. Now, where it starts to get challenging is, where's the copyright on this? And this is where a ton of conversations are happening right now. And you have people like Adobe that have taken a proactive approach to say that we are only using copyrightable, or sorry, imagery that we know we have the copyright to, and they're working out a payment mechanism through their Adobe system to <laughs> compensate the underlying artists where this stuff was derived from. So I know that's a lot to kind of throw out there. And if you want to see some examples, I can. But since we have limited time, I think it's easier for me just to send you some links because, I mean, anybody can use BART or ChatGPT. ChatGPT is embedded into Bing now. So let me just say one more thing and turn it back to you, Bob, is why I'm so passionate about this and actually dedicating the next company in my life to is getting this technology in the hands of artists. So I want artists not to fight it because you're going to lose. I'm sorry if you, if you say, I want to kill this. I want to put regulation. I want to do this. It's like fighting the internet. People tried to fight the internet. But if we let the tech companies be the ones that define for us how these are going to be used, we're going to have social media 3.0 that's 10 times worse than anything because it's going to know you at an emotional level like you wouldn't believe and sell you every piece of crap you don't need. And the kind of stories we're going to get are going to be genericized and bland. But if we take the lead and we use it with human abilities and we start to feed it data that's ethical, not just let it scrape the web, but we become part of the people that are feeding the large language models with things like, well, what does it mean to be inclusive? How do we not teach it that every person should be one certain color that's in things? We need us now because this is what we do. We, we uplift through our stories. And so this is a huge call to action for all you artists there to at least start to play with it and decide how you're going to move these conversations forward. I think the, the question in, in my mind and maybe other people's minds is how to use 
use it as a tool rather than how to how do, how do we still be, be stay creatives um and, and and incorporate all this uh what you're saying suggests that we have to be its servant rather than its master <laughs> no i'm actually suggesting it more be more collaborative so we're going to collaborate with ai <laughs> exactly well, yeah. I, you know, it's, it's it's sometimes easier than collaborating with with other people, but um, well, it raises, is. I raises mean, a lot of questions for me. It does, and I mean, Stephanie just put a really, I thought, great response here in the chat, and the the chat on Zoom, not the chat GPT, which is that. So, how do I personally use it? Could be a question. I, I write. I mean, I, I wrote the book to Winter Lights. So what I do is I use it in a way when I'm stuck. Like I just throw some ideas out there. I said, hey, I've got these characters that are doing this, this, and this. Uh, I need a plot twist. Give me like 10 plot twists. Now I could do that in Google. It just takes me a lot longer. And it's what I did. Or people have used rhyming dictionaries. People have used other things. And so that's how I, I collaborate with it. When we, I do almost all things like press releases and other things right now by using AI, just because it's so fast for me to do it. And it allows me to then curate in my head at a faster way to get to a point that I want to get to. I have one very basic question. Uh, can you tell us what Web 3.0 is? Web 3.0 is a, another covering term that moves from, and it's actually something, so we've launched an area called Humana 3, which is what I call Humanity 3.0. And the three technologies that I see changing the evolution of humanity are Web 3, XR, and AI. So I've talked about two of them. <clears throat> Web3 is an overall term that encompasses many more technologies underneath it. Somebody mentioned blockchain. Blockchain is a one of the key components of it. But a separate way of an easier way to think about it is in Web2, your identity is owned by the people you work with on Web2. <laughs> Meaning that you shop on Amazon, you use Instagram, you create an account. You give them all your information and they watch everything they do and they figure out who you are and they own all that data. You sign the terms and agreements says pretty much do whatever you want to with. Web3 creates a decentralized structure where you segregate your identity. So a lot of people think, well, Web3 is NFTs and it's dead. NFTs are one byproduct and they're not dead, by the way. They were so overly hyped and it was ridiculous what people were paying for a lot of these things. But the base component of that Web3, NFTs, blockchains are actually fantastic for artists because it's a way for us to digitally sign our work so that anytime it's reproduced, we can build what's called a smart contract in that says, I get 10% every time something happens. So I sell you, Bob, something, you buy it 10 years later, you sell it for 10 times X, you make money on it but I get a royalty back pay to me. So I'm working with some people to say, let's redo all the contractual systems in Broadway because they're so outdated right now and it's all done on paper and Excel. And I mean, still paper. If we could have that live on a Web3 ledger, it would be so much easier for us to pay artists every time something is used rather than trying to unravel it and figure it out. So again, I could go on for this for hours, but well, I think I think we have to take questions from the room. And by the way, guys, if you're if you're paying attention at all and you don't have any any questions, then you're not really paying attention. So um, I want to I want to hear questions from the room and questions and concerns because this this terrifies me. Oh, Nils, did you come in for a, a reason? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I was I was just jumping the gun on this. I have so many questions. Um, yeah, I would have a whole list here, um, but I guess I, I'll start at the top. Well, no, once, no. once we go through questions with you, and, and and don't don't do more than two questions. Okay, okay. Uh, because I, I want to I want to leave time for other people. Because uh, right, let me be... just do do one question, and then I'll step back, let other people, and then I'll 
actually give it some time to do another question. I didn't mean to actually jump on. But um, what uh, program are you using to create these worlds that you live in um, or when you're creating you know, your stage? Right. Excellent question. And again, if, if I can get a, a recap of these questions, Bob, I'll make sure to put together a lot of links. Very cool. So there's cool. okay. So oh, Owen, not only the ones that are in the chat, but also you're gonna have to jot down the ones that are being asked. Live. Yeah, that'd be great. So there, there's there's two approaches to it. So what I do first is I actually look on asset stores what people have built, and I just buy them and pay them. That Aurora Borealis was a ten dollar asset. The actual the lights doing it now for me to program from that from scratch would take forever. The so I, I look out there and I can send you links. Every, the Unity has an asset store. There's uh, Epic Games, who makes Unreal Engine, has assets. But then there's also ones that go across multiple game stores. So I start so there. You go, you go into Unreal Engine, un, into Unity, and you just work within there and create them. Yeah, but I even before I do that, I actually just go scour the assets and I create a living. So no, I have a question. It's based on what he's just said. Is there not a an, a a creative uh, app of some sort that you import the the assets into is it, where do you work i think he wants to know where's the workplace that, that he could use it doesn't sure. have to be the app store right so so i first again I, I i go again i come from a day when we were creative and we used to go buy magazines and cut the magazines out and tape them onto a board those were our mood boards so i do that virtually now so i find assets and i literally just put them into PowerPoint or something first to talk to the team. So PowerPoint would be it. So, so any, any, any you know, design, PowerPoint, app anything, be... just now I've got a living mood board. Now, once we sign off to it, then you're going to find your holes. So, hmm, we don't have anything that's the right lizard boy for what we want to do. So now you can use things that are simple that will just quickly mock it up or Blender is a great tool for creating 3D assets and it's open source free, meaning there's this massive community of people that know Blender. If you need an asset created for you, you can go on Upwork or Fiverr or anywhere and find somebody to build it for you. Once you have those assets to create a world, the two main ones are either Unity or Unreal. And they're both game engines. And they allow you to import the assets and work with them. Now, you can actually do it all in Blender or, or again, there's other choices. I just happen to know both of those game engines. And the nice thing is there are billions of free tutorials on YouTube. And so what I tell to everybody, I say, if you have passion for this, there's no barrier to entry. You don't need to go get a degree. In fact, by the time you get your degree, it's going to be outdated. I say just learn like my son learns, who's 20, is just find creators that are doing it, watch them and learn from them. Okay. And, okay. Yeah, so that would be like the first way of looking at it to create these worlds. And I mean, people are already putting up some really great stuff in the chat that I'm seeing too, like yeah. redefining. Owen, <clears throat> Owen, do you want to start uh, bringing in the questions? I wonder hey, you there. Thank you. So yes, give me, yes, here we go. Uh, all right, our first question are, uh, this is from Tita. When ChatGPT creates a good script, to what extent is that a factor of the human playwright's creative knowledgeable ability to shape the request and sequence the questions to grow the script and not just the system merging existing structural script patterns and merge data banks of dialogue? Basically, you answered it in the question, which is these engines are only as good as the scripting and prompting that we do. So that's kind of what makes them unique is the more you train it. So if I just said, write me the next hit musical that's like Hamilton, it's gonna come up with something just completely bland and basic. But if you feed it, you've done your backstory research and you feed it a lot of information about the world you wanna create, you're now focusing it. And then when you start to ask it questions, those questions are much more tied to what you're doing. So one thing I would suggest is if you already have a show, look at how it can help you with the marketing. That's a very simple way to get into this that's not as threatening as writing something from scratch. But whoever said that question, you're, it's about the human input that 
trains this thing. It's it's only as good as garbage in, garbage out. Owen, oh, next question. Next question. Is blockchain what is used to generate Bitcoin and isn't it easy to commit fraud with Bitcoin? <laughs> blockchain, it, it's a little bit of a complicated question. So blockchain is the mechanism that is used for the transfer slash storage of the digital currency called Bitcoin or Solana or pick anyone you want. The digital wallet is what actually stores them. But the way blockchain, sorry, the way Bitcoin and all of these things are created is a whole class into itself. It involves mining. It involves all this kind of stuff. The fraud side of it is a real, it depends. So in certain ways, it's actually more secure than traditional transactions because everything lives on a ledger. The way the fraud comes into play is when people get duped and give away their wallet IDs and give away other things that they shouldn't be giving away. But the base structure of a blockchain is actually more secure than even traditional transactional processes because of the identity structure of it. It's very hard for you to spoof the identity of somebody else. But when it happens, it can also happen at scale. So it's, it's boy, is it truly a real, it depends. Next up. All right. Uh, could you share your thoughts on AI agents such as AutoGPT, AgentGPT, the AI systems that can prompt themselves as opposed to ChatGPT, which is usually human prompting the AI? We got some real people that uh, have been thinking about this. So when you talk about the agents and, and you hear AutoGPT on there, Okay, this is where it starts to get a little scary. I will, I will fully admit. So I'm not, I'm not the one that's anybody that knows me knows that I'm an optimist. I'm I I'm come from Gene Roddenberry school of Star Trek, where I believe that the future should be positive. However, I'm not completely blind to this. So and and as are many people that are signing petitions saying, whoa, we got to really think about this. For those of you that have ever read the book Sapiens, <clears throat> he just, Duval just did this great talk a couple of weeks ago that says, and he, he even says the same thing. We got to get the, the storytellers, the artists involved, because what he said is AI has the ability to hack our intimacy, meaning knowing us so well. So what AutoGPT does is you give it a general prompt and it starts to go out and it does its own prompt creation and starts to dive into the entire solution by talking to other GPTs and other technology solutions. So there's some really scary examples. And a lot of this now they're trying to put walls around, which is give me the 10 ways that we could end humanity. It'll go out and work on it if we don't put guardrails around it. But even when we put guardrails, people find ways around the guardrails. So one thing that has a lot of people worried is AI doesn't need us humans. It needs our data now, but it's also creating its own data. So when you think about it as a child, if all you're feeding the child is McDonald's and frozen food from the cheapest place you can find, that's what your child is going to be. We need to be feeding these machines the most organic food we can in there. So that's that's why it is important for us to be able to look at this because the things well, we've like- all, We've all seen the movie and we're all terrified now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've seen Terminator and we, we don't want to create Skynet. And we're already starting to create Skynet in certain ways because the amount of money that's being invested in this, I-, I and part of a venture capital group, and they'll say, oh, well, so-and-so just invested $250 million in this, and somebody put $500 million in that. They're just throwing money at it because they know it's a huge commercial venture. Um, I don't want to keep you here forever, so, uh, Owen, I think there's a couple more questions. Yeah, there are a lot of people that just want to know if there are any specific communities uh, that they can research or join. Uh, you know, scenic designers use this technology. Mm -hmm. Are there, you know places where people that are interested in using this with theater and film. So if, are there any suggestions you have of 
people, uh, places to find like-minded people? Definitely. And I'll send that out because uh, it used to be I'd point people to Fifth Wall Forum because they've got a great Discord server. But some of my friends are very active in the day-to-day -day community side building of it. I, I go in and out, meaning that I spend a lot of time just building and then we run a theater accelerator and we share it. But I'm I'm not as active as I need to be, actually, in fostering conversations among people. It, it's having me make a realization where I'm saying, all of you need to go out and do this, and yet I can't give you an easy answer to that question. I should have that on the tip of my tongue. So I will, I will do that, and starting next week, we will curate stuff, maybe just a newsletter that I'll curate that can go out once a week to share that. So see, there's already things that people are putting in the chat, which is awesome that uh, th they exist and I speak at them. I just don't participate in them. I mean, it's terrible for me to say that. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I, I'm very transparent, as you can see. Like I will- I, I, like, I, I like Maureen's question. How can you control who has access to these AI programs to feed the moral values? Well, there's the challenge because right now, open AI, you look at the history of them, they were started as a nonprofit purely with a mission to do that. And now they've morphed into for-profit and Microsoft put 12 billion in them. And now you have Elon Musk who was part of them and now is not part of them and is gonna start his own and da, da, da. Uh, I, I'm also very skeptical on the regulation side of things for many reasons. I'm not saying we shouldn't have regulations. Just the, first of all, the pace that the government works at. Secondly, the experience. After I saw the TikTok hearings, I went, oh my gosh, these are the people that are running the country. They can't even ask a knowledgeable question. And the regulations are now being written by the tech companies. Well, who's that gonna protect? Uh, so again, I don't see fighting it by stopping it or regulating them. I see by, it's just got to be sheer force of enough good people pushing the right stuff out there. Oh, that seems so unlikely in the world we're in right now. But um, see, I don't think so. I, oh. see, the reason I think the world we're in right now is because we're we're really dictated by the algorithms on the Facebook and Instagram. And now when you look at TikTok, but I see so many people doing amazing stuff musically on TikTok. That's phenomenal. We have people making careers on there and they're building up these very positive communities. I see positive communities on Discord too. I see terrible communities too. But we that's why I just keep saying we can't wait for somebody else to solve this. Um, I'm going to keep moving. Uh, sure. Owen, and Owen, and I, I've got 20 more minutes, so I can uh, stay as long as you need me. Well, 20 more minutes. Oh, okay. Well, uh, at least uh, Lisa, Lisa, it's Lisa Snyderman. Uh, do, uh, she has a great question, I think. It's a simpler question, but I think it's one that, that deserves an answer. Sure. Uh, and I have to get going after this, so I'm going to just drop all the questions in one message. And uh, But can you talk about how well live theater tech, AR, VR, projection, mapping, immersive audio, etc., translates to virtual audiences in a hybrid staged performance mm. and what you recommend to give virtual audiences a live theater immersive experience? Excellent question. And the answer is so much of the skill sets and even the assets translate over. The challenge that we're facing right now, the reason I point out this headset is it doesn't have to be connected to a computer and it's cheaper compared to everything else. The problem with it is it's kind of like the first video game consoles where we're, we can only put so much into it, meaning that the photorealism that we have for creating our worlds is limited by the worlds that we're currently in. Therefore, we have to kind of grow with it. But the good news is that what you're talking about, what we already do in theater, makes us incredibly valuable to these worlds because we already think visually. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep moving. Um, 
Sure. Eric wants to know whether you're working with Apple, and if you can't tell him, just he'll <laughs> understand. All I will say is watch at 10 a.m. on Monday. I, all right. That's all I will say for right now. There you go. Um, oh, I want put all these in here, but some of them have already been answered. Uh, somebody wants to know where they find scenic designers who use this technology. And so most of the scenic design, it's it's um, most of the, again, it kind of depends. So some scenic designers now are hybrid shops where they do both projection and traditional scene work. And they've been using things like Vectorworks and other 3D design programs for many years already and translating them in. And then you have other scenic designers that have been around for a while that partner with a design shop. So for example, that's what we did on American in Paris. I mean, we had the amazing Bob Crowley working with 59 designs and it was so fun to watch the two of them collaborate together and talk about moving panels and actors projecting on it. The stuff that 59 designs is working on is the same stuff that's now being used in XR and other techniques. And that's what's kind of cool about what we're doing. So again, I sound like a broken record. Any university that's teaching projection design right now needs to be using projection design in VR because already in the Unreal Engine, you can bring in all of your tr traditional lights that we have. So there's a plugin for Unreal so I can design a stage and I can completely light design my theatrical show and put a headset on and stand in. All, of, all VR. And then that stuff actually turns into the DMX control when I move into the theater. Okay, so so now I'm, I'm something occurs to me. Are you saying that in order for us to work in in VR, um, it eventually will request require that all audience members have access to VR headsets? And isn't that sort of like where we were with computers, like many years ago, where the where there weren't that many of us who had computers? I was I actually had computers in the '80s, but um, there there weren't that many who had them. Um, so aren't we limited right now to an audience that actually has access to the to the same um, technology that we're using? Sort of. And I'll say it, it depends. So the in one way, yes, in the sense that if you design a full VR environment, and that's why I was saying we can't sell enough tickets to make it sustainable. But then you have people like Brendan Bradley and others who are creating ways to allow you to then take what's in that 3D world and what's called 2D pixel stream it just on the web. So now the audience does not have the same experience as the people wearing the headset, but at least they can experience. And the way I akin that is to, you can go sit in a Broadway show, but you can also live stream a Broadway show live. So you can have people watching at the same time, or you like basketball, you can go, this is like being in the basketball arena, watching it on 2D is like sitting at home watching it on your TV. Your TV. Okay, so, so these the devices, and then again, I'll start using this one. You can see they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller to the point that, especially when we get into augmented reality, already there are people that are building them that's the size of a prescription glass. Like we saw yesterday, there's a company that builds your prescription into your AR glasses. Oh my God. So this stuff's <laughs> going to get faster and smaller. And uh, again, and, and I'm not NDAing or giving away anything else, but just from the leaks about the Apple headset, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be somewhere between probably close to $3,000, but it's going to be the lightest thing people have seen today. Again, these are just from the leaks that you can see online. Any of you can look this up. I'm so going to actually going to buy a three thousand dollar headset. Okay, but... I'm going to actually ask people to to raise their hand. Uh, I I can't keep track of all the questions. So if we haven't answered something that you wanted answered, uh, give me a virtual hand raise. Okay, Niels, uh, you're back. Come on. Oh, sure. there's actually a, a great one I want to answer. Well, and then Niels can come in. This was yeah, yeah, from Drew. Ahead that said, how do you think this will change traditional theatrical collaboration model? For example, if a composer can pre-design a virtual set of costumes to their own vision using the technology, will that limit the autonomy and creative set designer and costume designer? I, 
I get this question in different ways all the time. And it's such a fantastic question. My answer always is it depends. So it depends in the sense that I know some young people that just want to do it all themselves. In the same way, when you look at the barrier entry to film, when I was younger, I couldn't make my own feature film. It was just too expensive. I needed a really expensive camera. I needed editing systems. I couldn't afford it. Now a kid in an iPhone and a laptop can make gorgeous films all by themselves. So there is a world where the writers are now going to be able to completely control every aspect, including, and we didn't get into digital humans in this, but including creating digital human avatars that you control their movements for to sing your songs and speak your words. I'll throw that in the links. I want you guys to go look at MetaHumans. Actually, I have one of them up here called Real Illusion that I'll show in a second. So yes, you are going to be able to take your musical and not have a single other human being besides yourself if you want to create it all yourself. Great. Oh dear. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying it's 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 a, and people are going to do it. That's not me. So how I use this is I use it as a fast track to get what's out of my head into something collaborative visually so that when I'm interviewing and working with designers, I see what they gravitate towards. And then I want them to run with it. So for me, this is what will allow, or it, I'm already doing it. I mean, this is what allows me to say, okay, here's what's in my head. Go bring your magic because there is another world where some people say they'd rather just let them take a blank script and come up with their own stuff. And I always say, for me, I say, take what, here's what I got, see what you think, and then give me something. If you think I'm wrong, show me what you think I'm wrong on, but don't spend four days making it perfect. Sketch it up quickly. Maybe use generative AI if you want to, I won't judge you. Because once they do that, we can all start speaking the same language. Because again, most musicals fall apart when you start adding creative teams if they're not speaking the same. If they're not telling the same story, you're immediately dead. And you think, oh, that can't happen on Broadway. It's happened on Broadway more than you think. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do two more questions. Uh, normally, Tim, I, I I would have ended by now. We would have breakout rooms, and uh, people could actually ask you things like in in your room. But um, well, let's keep going, Niels, and then Eric, and then. And then I think we're going to probably wrap up. Niels? Niels? Yeah, one of the things I really appreciated at the beginning of this was when you were talking about uh, the importance you were putting on helping to build a buzz and build your audience and connect with them. And that you put a lot of time into, you know, like even in creating like a visual experience when you were doing, I think it was for hair. Mm -hmm. um, but do you feel like, you know, when you're doing a lot of these promotional things, do you feel like it's a, a case of, of just try anything and everything to see what works? Or are there certain things that you could do that might detract from it? So for instance, um, I'm at a place where we're already pretty, I feel like pretty close with the script. I don't know that it makes sense to do a reading, but maybe that would make sense just for the promotional side of things. And as I think about new ideas, I, I'm sometimes torn wondering if it's actually going to detract as opposed to help build the buzz. And I was wondering if you had thoughts about that. The, well, that was a lot of question. It's really just one question. It's all. It really is all one because this comes up a lot of different ways. Is when is the right time? Is really what you're saying to release the genie out of the bottle? And uh, yeah, actually, yeah, because and, I think once you start, I think dripping it. Mm, once you start, I feel like you really got to start being consistent. And so there are two. Writing, but, and so that's actually an interesting point. So there are two differing schools of thought on that. One is to lock your brand and own brand identity. I actually have a different view on that. I think that people, I think you need, you can't just throw everything and say, oh, we're this, we're that, we're that. Like you need to know tonally who you are. And that all boils down to the old adage of tape your theme to your keyboard. The theme is what you're selling. The plot, the characters, all that other stuff, they're the eye candy. But at the end of the thing, what, what do I walk away emotionally? So I'm more of, again, it depends on where you're at. 
So a lot of, especially the younger generation, they're totally cool with sharing stuff the minute it came out of their head. I mean, Jorge, who was one of our Theater Accelerator alums, wrote his latest musical on Discord in real time with his audience. He's like, oh, I just woke up and I had this great idea. What do you guys think? And he played it. They love it because they feel like they're part of the process. Yeah. He's got this voracious group of people that want to see him succeed. That's not necessarily for everybody. For somebody like yourself, who's might be a little bit farther along, I actually, especially at the early stages, and this is where data comes into play, and there are lots of ways to A, B, C, D test things. Different audience types, and I hate to use the term the baby boomers, the millennials, the Gen X, the Gen Zs, because I feel like that's a little, you, you can put yourself into a box. It's not necessarily great, but I look at what people say are the patterns, the buying patterns and the engagement patterns of those types. So if you look at the people my age, we grew up in a world where a lot of our entertainment was curated for us. The movie studios, the Broadway houses, I'd like to be surprised. I don't want to know about the show before I go into it. The schools I'm kids I'm working with in high school, just the opposite. They want to listen to the soundtrack. They want to know all the actors. They want to follow them on social. They want to, you name it. Guys, we're not going to be able to take any more questions. Okay, no problem. But I'm just telling you that. So in this one, you have to decide what works for you but I do encourage testing. So if you hire a marketing company and they say, this is the one size fits all and give us X number of thousands of hundreds of millions of dollars, be wary of that because data can tell you what is working and what is not working. And ultimately it all resolves down to the ticket sales. Okay, I'm, I'm, going, going, to, I'm going to move to Eric, but Eric, you can only ask your question if you can ask it in 20 seconds or less. <laughs> Seriously, 20 seconds or less, no more. I'm going to stop you at 20 seconds. Eric? Yeah. Uh, what are you doing now creatively with AI? Do, not be beyond testing. What's going, what are the next things that are coming? So I'm playing with what, right now I'm looking at the digital creation of music lyrics and how avatars can be puppeted with the AI. Meaning you are actually communicating with what would in the game world be called non-player characters. Part of why I want to do that is because I know it's coming and I'm, I'm concerned as what this is going to do to the acting community when we've already seen it in music where, again, musician, you see it right now going on with Here Lies Love at the Broadway theater. They, where want, they want 19 musicians in there. They want, now, again, I, I can see both sides as a producer. I don't want 19 musicians in that show because that's not what it was designed for. That's, it's hard to keep the show going. So we're, we're that way as an artist, I wanna see 30 musicians. Like I, I love live music. The, this well, conversation the, the, is gonna be happening, the it's here already lies happening with human beings now. The Here Lies Love conversation is not a, exactly what we're talking about today, but it's a very interesting situation. It's It's been an issue for in theater for like, 20, 30 years. It's particular. Here Lies Love has successfully been performed with tracks, and yeah. it's been it's been a success. Exactly. It's been a proven success. So now they're saying to the producers, "Please, I'd like you to spend a hundred thousand dollars more so we can have musicians." Yeah. And it, it, it's it now is a and now's well, not now's not the time to ask. <laughs> and so what you're gonna find, and and this is why I think it's really important for all of us to be involved. I can already. The term is called deep fake. You want to sing like Patti Lapone? I can create an avatar of Patti Lapone. I use a thing called Eleven Labs. I can learn, train her voice. You now could sing like Patti Lapone without having Patti Lapone. I mean, it's it's currently available right now. So, what does that mean for actors? What does it mean for a lot of different things? Well, the writers are already on strike about it. So, they're on strike. What's What's, I, I, again, I don't know what the results are going to be on it. The challenge is everybody's trying to solve what's going to happen in the next 10 years. We don't even know what's going to happen in the next year. That's how fast this is all moving. 
And the, I mean, this is for a whole other thing. Like we have conversations in the theatrical world. Broadway is definitely not the same as it was pre-pandemic. When you look at the expenses have gone up and the ticket sales are not at the same level. We're not only competing against getting people back in theater, we're competing against people that have now gone purely digital and they spend all their time on TikTok. So you got the Writers Guild fighting for what's being created by Disney, what's being created by Netflix, but they can't stop all the individual content creators. And we don't know what the next thing's going to be past TikTok. There can be a fully digital version of what would normally be a network that is all AI driven, that has no union infrastructure that people can sign up for. Well, I'm going to have to end. I wanted <laughs> I wanted Stephanie Grayson to ask her question, but I, I can't now. Um, this is now the longest podcast we've done in three years. Um, I'm sorry. So, no, no, no. It's it's not you. It's the root. It's the the topic, I guess. Well, um, end the so, podcast, and then I can ask, let, answer a few more questions. I will do that. So, everybody, uh, thank you for listening. This has been a ninety minute podcast for an hour show. Um, but a lot of good information. I hope everybody's found it interesting and and intriguing, and um, will uh, and maybe a little frightening. Uh, but here we are. We've done it. We've we've talked to Tim. Tim, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, obviously, I don't know anybody who knows more about this than you you, you do, or, or or Eric has a whole other uh, grasp of it as well. Um, the, for those of you who'd like to be in the room and ask the questions, uh, again, email me at true donate t r no uh, at my email address t r u n l t d at aol dot com t r u n l t d at aol dot com. And if you like the fact that we're doing this and we're doing this every week and this is 157 consecutive weeks. Uh, that we're doing it and you want to see us keep doing it, consider donating. Uh, we do this for free. We allow people to come in for free. It's it's pay what you can. My assumption is if people don't pay, it's because they can't pay. So, uh, but if you can, go to true, Eric, okay. Uh, go to truedonate.com, T-R-U-Donate.com and give us a, a little donation and support uh, so that we can keep do, doing this I don't know forever, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be here forever, but you know, we'll do it for a long time, a couple more years, maybe. So thank you and uh, join us uh, next week. I've got uh, legendary Mark Russell who runs the Under the Radar Festival. Uh, he's coming. He's been a key figure in non-traditional theater for 20, 30 years. He's he, he's the guy. Um, so it'll be an interesting conversation. Um, thank you for being with us tonight, and see you soon. That's it. Good night. Okay.